afternoon. This is uh, CIVE 632, Computational Hydraulics and Hydrology. Today is Wednesday, October 20th. And uh, the subject today is dynamic waves. Uh, we're going to cover three papers. The first one is on the applicability of HEC RAS. The second one is on the Muskingum conch with lube ratings, and the third one is on the short waves, the so-called gravity waves, which I have often referred to them as the dynamic waves because that's their their correct name is the dynamic waves of Lagrange. Uh, so as you can see, we will cover the entire s s uh, dimensionless wave number spectrum with uh, with this coverage. We're starting we started with the kinematic waves several weeks ago, then we went to the diffusion waves, and now we're going to the dynamic waves. So let me share the, the content with you. Okay, can you see the green page? Yeah, we see it. Okay, cool. Is, is Hunt there? No, I don't think so. Any hands not there, right? Okay. Okay. So let me first, I, I love history. Uh, we need to understand the history of these things that we work with. So I'm going to do a couple of minutes on the history of HEC. HEC was the lab at HEC. Uh, it's called Hydrologic Engineering Center. And it's located in Davis, up north of here, Davis, California. It was created on or about 1968 for the purpose of developing software for the for the for use of the Army Corps of Engineers. But in reality, when these people relate or release a model which is free and it's a government model endorsed by the federal government, it's basically used throughout the United States and, and by extension throughout the world. So they're, they're very popular models. Uh, it's very the work that the Army Corps does is very important if anything, because it's used a lot. Any usage uh, demands that we consider it important. Okay, 1968. Now, it took them 30 years to change from, from what I call character cell to GUI, uh, as opposed to, meaning GUI, graphical user interface, is not character cell. All computers used to work with character cell beginning beginning when we had a CRT maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, well, first it was teletype, then it was CRT, and then eventually the CRTs got converted into flat screens, and then you had the, the graphical user interface. But at the beginning, it was character cell. Character cell, you would use cards or any uh, typing into the computer. The data was typed into the computer and so forth. Uh, but in 1998, well, the revolution of Windows came about in the early 90s. And by 1998, the, um, the Army Corps has, had finished, um, as they say, uh, charging their batteries, and they opened up with RAS, the first model, I believe it was both HMAs and RAS. So we know for a fact that HEC-1, the hydrology model of the Army Corps, uh, switched or, or, or I guess as you can say, transformed itself into the GUI, its GUI version was called um, HEC HMS, or Hydrologic Modeling System. The HEC tool, or HEC2, was form, developed into HEC RAS, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So HEC RAS is the is the successor to HEC2. The, the Army Corps also had some other models, HEC3, 4, 5, and 6. 3 was the um, reservoir model, I believe. I did, never used it, so I really don't know too much about it. And 6 was the bed, bed uh, movable bed model. 4 and I, I, I never heard too much about 4, and 5 was out there somewhere. But the point is that now they developed uh, they developed Hegras and they decided to 
to do one model with various, various components. So they started loading in the components. The first component that they had was a steady flow, which was originally part of HEC1. I'm sorry, HEC2, I'm getting confused here. So the steady flow got started in 1998. I happen to know because in 1996, I went out there for a short visit and met with Arlen Feldman and asked him what was going on with their models because I was intent at the time, uh, something I actually never completed, uh, to finish uh, the second edition of my book. I actually completed partially the project. I just guess, ran out of steam later on. Unusual for me, but I did. Uh, the second edition of my book, so I wanted to see what was the status of HEC1 and HEC2. And he said, Pons, we put those two models in the back burner because once we get the GUI versions, we're not going to touch them. We're going to retire them. And he was correct, okay? I mean, now he was correct. He, he just said what was going on. That was in 1996. So in 1990, I expected uh, the GUI versions to come shortly. And they did. In 1998, they released both uh, uh, HEC RAS and HEC HMS versions in GUI. Now, what is GUI? So you, we understand what's going on here. Uh, many people talk bad about Fortran, and they say, oh, Fortran is old, passe. I mean, only old people use it. That is not true. What the Army Corps did in prior to 1998, as they built their models, was to take the, it's called a kernel, take the kernel, the, the, the basic core of the, of the Fortran HEC uh, two model and wrap it up and make make the floating point uh, I'm sorry no the graphical user was going to be done with C I'm not sure it was with C or C++ but it was C okay and uh, uh, and that basically that's what they did that wrapped up the Fortran kernel with a visual component uh, which was uh, done on uh, with C. And therefore, when you run HEC RAS, and you will, and you have already, you're running a Fortran kernel, a Fortran calculator. And that is why HEC RAS is so fast. Even though it's loaded with the graphical user interface, it still performs really well. I mean, when you run HEC RAS, it's really amazing. You hit the button, run, and then less than a fraction of a second, you got an answer, okay? Depending on the complexity of the problem, of course, but that is the truth. So, so I do not believe we should be going around saying that Fortran is not being used because it is used all the time, but it's in the background. Why? Because Fortran doesn't do any graphics. So you could not have done GUI with Fortran, simply said, and I've said that many times already. So Fortran is out there in the background. It, I do not believe it will be dumped or thrown away because it has not been replaced to this point by anything that it is as fast and as effective. So it's there. Whether we like it or not, we are using Fortran. Okay, so the gentleman over at the, or, or people out there at, at um, HECRAS, or rather at HEC Davis, uh, came up in 1998 with um, with a steady flow, which was a reproduction of what what the original HC2 did in 1968. For 30 years, they did it with character cell. 1998, they were going to come up with the GUI version. Now, in the process of doing this, they made a couple of changes. There were minor changes. So it is my understanding that if you run the same data with HC2 and RAS. It's not exactly the same because they made minor changes in something secondary. Okay, they felt that it was necessary that they upgrade the model, and they did it. So, so that is a fact, uh, and they say that in their manual. In their in their manuals, they say that there is a slight difference between the results, but it really is not a, a whole lot of uh, distance or difference between the one and the second one. Their original plan, which they stuck to, was to develop, uh, come up with a version on steady flow, which they had already pretty much cooked, right? They had to set up the GUI version and then take their time to come up with the unsteady flow. And so they did. 
in the year 2002, I believe, I could be wrong, plus or minus one year, they came up, they came up with the unsteady flow, that number two. Today, our job is to compare steady flow vis-a-vis -vis unsteady flow. As third component, I, I believe it was a, around the year 2007, they came up with two-dimensional flow, then later on mobile, mobile boundary, movable, movable boundary flow, mobile boundary is the same thing, and five temperature and water quality, and I believe, I could be wrong on this, but I believe they are getting ready, if not, they haven't done so already, developed the, uh, the, uh, the three-dimensional model that everybody around the world, those that are ahead of the game, are working on. The Europeans, the French already have a three-dimensional, a working three-dimensional model. The Spanish, I believe, have to that, also that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure about the other uh, countries out there, but the three-dimensional model is the up-and-coming thing in our field. Unfortunately, Professor Ponce, uh, I mean, I'm retired in a year or so, I, I'm not going to do that. Maybe you guys will get involved in it. The, the current uh, understanding is that we're doing the 2D models fine and we'll get into three whenever it's appropriate. Now, there's a difference between the 2D models and the 3D models. The 3D models are full representations of what's actually happened in nature, but of course they're difficult, difficult to run, difficult data, difficult to run. The 2Ds are much somewhat, somewhat simpler, but they don't do the whole story because the world is not 2D. You could pretend that it is 2D, but it's not. The world is 3D, and we happen to know that, and I'm going to talk about that later on in more detail. Okay, so the 1D is what just about everybody does. And even in the 1D, there is an issue between steady and unsteady. So I am here to talk about the difference in when would one be justified in going unsteady instead of steady. That's the, uh, the idea of today's lecture, first lecture. Okay, so it's already this everything that I say in here has already been said. When is it necessary to use unsteady flow? Let me first give you a little bit of the history. When the Army Corps heard Danny Fred in 1987, when I was there visiting with them, they knew that, that sooner or later they had to put the unsteady flow feature because it was a thing that was up and coming. People were going to talk about it, right? How come the Army Corps doesn't do this? Um, so they listened to what Danny Fred had to say. And, uh, and then after, I'm, I'm not privy to their discussions, but they engaged one of our Colorado State University students that happened to be out there on a sabbatical in 1993. Uh, his name is Robert Barkov. We, you spell Barca, B-A-R-K-A-U. Robert Barca were out there, went out there to Davis and engaged them, and something must, must have happened, and they decided to hire or pay a certain amount of money to Robert so that he could either help them or build a model, the unsteady flow component with them. And so he did. He had a, a, a model that he had built in, in the middle 80s at Colorado State and was using it commercially. So um, whatever it was, and I haven't talked about to Bob, I knew Bob. Bob. Bob was, interestingly, one of my students. In the year 1979, I gave a class. I gave my second class in this subject, and Bob Barco was there. So Bob, long story made short, Bob was involved with the Army Corps in developing their unsteady flow model. To what extent uh, he reproduced his own model within the HEC RAS, I don't know. I think there were minor variations. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Uh, besides, we, uh, the only thing we could do is read the reference manual. We can't change the model. The model is packaged and given to us as a, what they call object code. Object code you cannot touch. Okay? By the way, was it yesterday, maybe? Yeah, that was Monday. That I was saying that PHP was slow compared to Fortran. Okay, and I didn't tell you the difference. I just said, I just threw it out there and said PHP is slower, 10 times to 100 times slower. But I didn't tell you why. But I know the reason. One of the reasons, uh, besides the architecture, one of the reasons is the procedure. Fortran does not run the code. Fortran runs the object code. 
not the code itself. So therefore, in this process, there's the, the translation into object, and then there's the running. So Fortran splits it into two parts. So you always do the running of the object code, and that's easy because that's machine language, okay? Well, PHP, for whatever reasons, those that build PHP doesn't do that. PHP starts from scratch every time it runs. So it has to do everything, the translation and then the handling of the object code. No wonder it's much, it's much slower. Uh, I also, besides the fact, I think I already mentioned to you, the PHD does just about everything. Well, Fortran only does floating point. And that has got to be the main reason why PHP is much slower compared to Fortran. Um, so what's the commercial side of this? The commercial side of this is that when I saw my computer, my first computer in 1966, only engineers and scientists were using the computer. It was, it was a tool for engineers and scientists. And 30 years later, it became a tool for a whole lot of other professions. And finally, by the year when the, when the cell phones became established about 25 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, widely available, it be, a computer became a tool for everybody, just everybody. I mean, your cell phone is a computer itself, right? So, and a lot of people do all kinds of stuff. They visit their email, they talk, they share photos, but that stuff is not highly in, computationally intensive. So it doesn't require a whole lot of memory and a whole lot of computational power. And that is why I presume that those that build these things decided that speed was not of the essence for them because they, nobody was going to use them for speed computations. That is a fact. Okay, so now we go back in here and we are going to explain, explain why, when is it necessary to use unsteady flow. This question is of considerable practical interest since unsteady flow is significantly more complex and requires more data. Okay, the chances of your steady flow computation going bad on you is rare, one, about a, one out of a hundred. The chances of your unsteady flow computation going bad on you is half of the time. So it's costly because if the project goes bad on you, you gotta go back, you gotta fix it, you gotta fiddle with it, and your time is money. So the unsteady flow computation is costly. The question, of course, is does it give us better answers? Are we justified in paying more money to pursue the answer for an unsteady flow situation? And that's where what we are here to, um, to deal with. Now, let me also say that the object of this whole thing changes whether you're using hydraulics or hydrology. Now, when Danny Fred was doing his NWS model, I actually never talked about with with this about uh, with about this subject with Danny. I had very short conversations with Danny. I met him two or three times in my entire life. But Danny was working with the National Weather Service, and the National Weather Service was interested in developing flood forecasting models, which are uh, hydrology models, basically hydrology models, not hydraulics models. And my sense is that. Danny was actually look, looking at, at coming up with hydrology answers more than hydraulic answers. So he was concerned about the dynamic wave because the dynamic wave, if, if, if you're calculating large basins, maybe it's needed, but in a short situation it's probably not needed as I am going to explain today. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying here that the answer is not straightforward. I have been in many places around the world. Well, not every place, but I've been in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, okay, in Canada, and I've seen people complain to me that they tried to run the dynamic way, but they couldn't run it, they had to give it up. And I, I understand them, I understand them, because I know it is exactly the way it is. So the dynamic wave calculation is not robust. And I introduce in here a term that is used in our field. Robustness means strength, strong. The, pro the program doesn't dump on you. Now, robustness could look good. Oh, the model is robust, but it's a double-edged sword. 
because if the model is too robust, maybe it has too much numerical diffusion, then you always get an answer, but the answer is wrong. So it has to be taken with a grain of salt. Just robustness itself does not justify using the system. The Lee model of uh, watershed routing that I've explained to you and I talk bad about it, it's very robust, and yet it's always inaccurate. So robustness itself. On the other hand, if you're looking for robustness, if you get robustness, then you're fine, you're happy, right? So these issues, we will talk about these issues in a couple of weeks more in more detail, uh, week 11, I believe. So we'll get there eventually. So the answer is not straightforward. Steady versus unsteady flow. Under steady flow, you specify a discharge, one value of discharge upstream in one value of stage downstream for that discharge. And then you proceed to do the backwater calculation. It's a simple calculation. There's a lot of computations involved in here. We have developed in the year 19, no, in the year 2007, I believe. We developed a calculator. I sat down for a couple of weeks to develop all the calculators. And we did. once you develop one, you can develop all the others. They're all the same. You just have to change the plus and the minus and so forth. So we have these calculators that you guys have used if you took my class. Now, as other people have done these calculations, not too many, not too many people get into online calculators. But these calculators were done for the first time by a gentleman named Bresse. I believe that that's the pronunciation of his name, B-R-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, back in the middle 30s. He's the one that first did the Bresse curves and the Bresse calculation. Subsequently to Bresse, everybody was doing it. Uh, and finally, in the, in the year 1968, the Army Corps came up with their HEC2, which is a software that does that calculation. Parallel to that, the Soil Conservation Service had its own software, not online, of course, but they had their own software. I don't remember the name of it right now. So various agencies, I'm not sure about the Bureau of Reclamation, but there were, there were programs out there. Um, you could, if you were able to, uh, develop a, a table in a spreadsheet that would do simply the the, uh, the backwater curve, which is what we're talking about here. Only that there, since there's 12 curves, it would be a little messy that you do all of them. But you could do the M1 and the M2, fine, because those are the most common ones. Okay, so, so that's the steady calculation. It's easy, it's been done since the 1930s, originally by Bresci, followed by the Army Corps, the Soil Conservation Service, and a whole lot of people, not just in the United States, in Europe and other places around the world. Okay, under unsteady flow, the user specifies a discharge upstream. So there's a variability of discharge and a discharge rating at the downstream. And then you have five reaches, 10 unknowns, and 12 points. That means the upper point has to be determined and the downstream point has also to be determined. So therefore you have a, a determinate solution, 10 unknowns and 10 equations and 10 unknowns. Five reaches, 10 equations, 10 unknowns. They're listed in there. Okay, under steady flow, the discharge stage ratings are unique. They, that is, they are the same as in unsteady kinematic flow. Kinematic flow is unsteady or unsteady kinematic flow, but the steady, uh, the rating curve of the kinematic wave is the steady rating, uh, the steady flow. It's the same. It's basically the same. So the peak of the kinematic wave would would give you an answer, and that answer is the the act, the answer of the steady flow also. Now under dynamic flow. The model calculates loop discharge stage rating according to the variability of the flow. We know that not just because it's, 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 it's the thing to do, but because in 1976, Abba told us that. Remember, we just read that paper. He said, there's something weird in here. This is a pathology problem here. We got something that we can't really face. And when I talked to Wilheiser about this many years ago, he said, you know, the dynamic wave is is Mickey Mouse because you got to know the answer before you know before you know the answer. That's what, he didn't say Mickey Mouse. I don't think they would use that word. But he says we can't. It's chicken and egg. I think he used chicken and egg. We we have to know the answer before we get to the to the situation. Um, nevertheless, it, the use continued because 
either because we purposely or involuntarily forgot the issue that Abbott had told us about, the fact that uh, rating was non-unique, that it was looped rating. Okay, so we say in here, the specification of a unique, that is kinematic discharge rating at the downstream contradicts the solution at that boundary. Those are the words of none other than Abbott. Simply stated, the wave cannot be kinematic at the downstream boundary and dynamic everywhere else. That would be a, that would be a dichotomy, and you can sort that out. Okay, so how, now, how, how do you avoid that? Well, we developed a methodology to do that. I believe this methodology had also been used by Danny Fred in his DWAPR model, because I talked to him about it presentially. One day I, I was talking to him. I was at a conference somewhere in the East Coast, and he was there, and, and I decided to approach him and talk to him about this because I was interested, and he, uh, he agreed with me. He said, well, that's one way of doing it. Okay, so a way out, out of this difficulty is to artificially move to the downstream boundary further downstream, and to specify the unique discharge rating, which is artificial, at the downstream boundary, at the new artificial. And to let the model, since the model is a good model and it'll develop the loops, then it'll start developing the loop as it moves upstream, as it shows here. There's no loop downstream, but by the time you get to the middle, you get a loop. And we have tested twice and three times the length, and we feel, we feel that twice is good enough for most practical cases. But if you're unsure, you could go three times. You can put it, this stuff in there. I mean, the computer is for you to do all kinds of calculations, right? So it, it, there's no problem. There's no problem with computer time, like there used to be many, many years ago when I started my career. Everybody's got a whole lot of power right on top of their, on their desktops. The servers are out there. Extremely fast servers that we have right now. Probably a million times faster than 30, 40 years ago, and perhaps even more. Okay, so the decision to use or not to use unsteady flow will depend on whether the wave being analyzed is either kinematic or dynamic. So you got to think about this. Am I going to impose here a kinematic wave or a dynamic wave? If the wave is kinematic, the discharge will not vary in time. It will not diffuse. The wave kinematic wave doesn't diffuse. The discharge rating, was, rating will be unique because it is kinematic, therefore it has no loop, and it has no loop is a, is a unique discharge rating because the loop is the one that causes the diffusion. That we know. And third, the downstream boundary condition may be specified as a unique rating because it, the whole thing is unique. The whole rate, all the ratings are unique. In this case, the solution of steady and unsteady flow are essentially the same. Therefore, the unsteady flow calculation is not needed if the wave is kinematic. Now, if the wave is dynamic, if you say for whatever reason, no, my wave is dynamic, or diffusion. Diffusion is not kinematic anymore. So if the, if the wave is dynamic, now the issue here is when is the wave dynamic? The answer is my estimation would be in less than 5% of the cases in the real world, not even, 1%, I would say. So the wave is dynamic only very unusual circumstances. One of the places where a wave could be dynamic is during a dam breach. The dam breached and re released a dynamic wave. That's correct. But we're not analyzing floods in all cases under dam breach situations. Now, I do believe that if, we, if the consideration is a dam breach, then we should use a dynamic wave just for the, for the sake of safety because it's possible that it is dynamic, right? 50% possible that it is dynamic, uh, uh, or tends to be dynamic. It's not exactly dynamic. If we are 100% dynamic, the wave will dissipate and we wouldn't have a flood downstream, according to Lagan and Widow. And that is not the case. Um, uh, Teton Dam failed and it killed a lot of people, even though the wave was dynamic. We have calculated that way, okay? The discharge will vary in time and space, attenuating as it moves downstream, the calculated discharge will not be unique because it's attenuating. For better accuracy, the downstream boundary may be, may be moved downstream artificially to allow for a loop rating. I already talked about that technique. In this case, the unsteady flow calculation is justified, assuming, of course, the wave is dynamic. So here it is. If you say my wave is kinematic, dump the unsteady flow. If you say my wave is dynamic, then use it. Well, 
by all means, because your wave is dynamic, right? And the dynamic wave does that, roughly. I mean, that's actually a diffusion wave, not a dynamic wave. I just didn't want to put it too extreme in here. But the, the actual dynamic wave is a lot more than that. Why do I say that? The British did an ex uh, prize out of the British uh, Wallingford uh, lab at, in England. Um, they did an extensive study of the applicability of the diffusion wave, even before I had done any work on it. And they said that if the work, if the flood was less than 30% diffusive within uh, one period of propagation, and that's, that's loosely speaking, one period of propagation. Uh, I say loose, loosely speaking because if it attenuates, then you can't really track down the period because it, it changes. But I mean, you know, we can do this in an approximate fashion. And within one period of propagation, as Price said, if it's less than 30%, it is diffusive. So if it's zero, it's kinematic. Less than 30% diffusive. More than 30% may be kinematic. It's a real, real kinematic. It will disappear 90% within a, when one period of propagation. I'm sorry, if it's really uh, dynamic, it will dissip dissipate. Okay. Now, the question is, our practice, we're engineers. We're hired to do calculations for either design or, or forecasting. Most calculations are for design. 90%, I'd say. I always put, put percentages on things. Uh, why? Because that's where engineers, civil engineers, are involved in the design. In the forecasting, not so much. There are some civil engineers doing forecasting, but they're usually working with the National Weather Service in the forecasting. There's two issues here, forecasting and design. There's also hind casting, but the hind casting is another issue. That's when a, a dam fails and you're hind casting the failure. But that, let's leave that separate for the time being. But there's two major activities, design and forecasting. Now, the design is very precise, while the forecasting is chancy. Because it's usually forecasting of floods, and it has to rely on the, on, the, on the rain, and we really don't have any certainty as to what's the amount of rain. We have a feeling of what it is, but we cannot know for sure the temporal and spatial distribution of the rain. I don't care what people say. You know, I had a, I had a discussion with my friends over at SES the other day. They're, sp they're spending a lot of time, a lot of effort, committees, this and that trying to figure out if the Marcus equations are correct. They interviewed me on June 22nd, and the interview is posted on the web. By the way, if you're interested, I can send you the link. And I basically told him at the end, he says, I mean, it's, it's great that you guys are doing this work, reviewing what Marcus did for correctness and this and this and that. I said, that really, really doesn't matter. Excuse me, guys, but it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Boy, they really were surprised what I was talking. But they know they respect me, so they, they were listening. And I said, because the real issue here is whether the spatial and temporal distribution of the rain is correct. So it's not so much the conversion that is correct, the, the rain from rainfall to runoff, but rather the distribution of the original data, which is the rain. And they cannot be guaranteed under any circumstances. When Wuhiser, I'm going to start to finish here. When Wuhiser uh, did his uh, work, when was that? When he did it, no, Wuhiser wrote a paper in 1995 that I think we have read or we will read. And he said, I had a five acre plot of land over at, uh, in Arizona that he was studying at uh, Walnut Gulch in Arizona, uh, the experimental watershed of the Agricultural Research Service. And he said he had a five-acre plot. And he was sure that if he wanted to pick up the rain distribution, he had to put in there five rain gauges, one per acre. Now, if you, you can imagine, I mean, it of course is an exaggeration, but that means that, that even Wuhiser, with this very tiny little five-acre plot, was uncertain about the rain, spatial, temporal, and rain distribution. So that's the, the I guess you could say, the Achilles heel of, uh, of the modeling, but we don't really care too much about it because it's gotta be done. The design has to be done. And that's why we have design and forecasting. We don't pay too much attention to the forecasting because we typically don't do it. We, most of the projects that we do are design. Okay, so we have examples of designs in here. I have one that shows the Welton Mohawk Canal in Welton, that's a steady flow. 
And then there's another example of the Chanel River in Bolivia that's unsteady flow. I happened to be there at one time and we went on an inspection for some dredging that they were going to do. And we ran into a storm, into a huge storm, and we had to ride the wave. That's a wave. That's a flood wave. And we were on top of it. So on two or three occasions, I have had to do this because I was caught in the field in the middle of the storm. Okay, so now we finish up in here. The preceding considerations beg the question of whether a given flood wave can be called either kinematic or dynamic. Or better yet, whether a dynamic wave should be used at all to determine stages in the design of channel improvement projects. On typical projects or limited channel lengths, usually a, a mile or two, they don't give you any more. Because nobody's going to do out their uh, improvement for a river 100 miles. It's just too costly. They don't do it. They do it in stretches, in, in, by, by, by uh, periods, or rather stages. On typical projects of limited channel lengths, a kinematic wave, which keeps its discharge constant, is a more appropriate assumption than a dynamic wave, which attenuates its discharge. That is obvious. If you're going to do it for design, you want to keep the discharge constant, because you want to get the maximum possible, possible, the risky, the more risky situation. If you want to do a forecasting, then you want to attenuate the wave. But we're not doing forecasting here. We're doing design. So it really depends on what you're going to be doing. So if you're hired to do design, I wouldn't touch the dynamic wave with a 10-foot pole. Indeed, the kinematic wave assumption assures that the channel is designed to contain all waves, kinematic or dynamic. The stages calculated with the kinematic wave are essentially the same as those calculated using steady, gradually varied flow. Therefore, the use of the unsteady flow feature for the calculation of stages in the design of channel improvement does not appear to be warranted. How, how could I come up with such a strong statement? Because I truly believe on what, I, on what I'm saying. I uh, wrote this thing maybe, I don't know, it's, it's dated recently, November 11, right? I think it was November 11. And then subsequently to that, I did a video. On this, which I tried to show you the other day, we're not going to look at it now because it's repetitious. Uh, it's, it's graphical, but it's the same thing. Now I've explained it in, in uh, vector form. Vector form is what I call the report, okay? Not raster, vector. And um, so where, where was I here? Well, I kind of lost my train of thought in here. So this is basically, we're saying that we should, oh, 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 I, I, I brought it brought back to me. A couple of years after I had published that video, I'm not sure if it was a couple of years or about a year, but it was about that time. I started getting a lot of traffic on that video. You know, I have a lot of videos on the web and I know which ones are getting the traffic because YouTube tells you that. I started getting a lot of traffic on this view, on this video. And, and I, it is disproportionate to the rest of the traffic on my site. And I am guessing that the Army Corps put this video on their site. So it was being hit all over the world because it was being hit a uh, part of the Army Corps. That's one thing that happens to you. If you put a video on the web and there's no traffic, then all of a sudden it starts getting traffic. It's because somebody big has actually picked up your video and linked to it. That's the only explanation for it. So I believe the Army Corps does not mind this video, even though it's, it kind of runs counter and if you look at the ma their manuals, they say, yes, the unsteady flow is used in certain, unspe in certain specialized circumstances. They actually don't get into talk about what I'm saying here today, unfortunately, either because they just couldn't come up with it or they don't want to talk about it. You know, whatever it is, I'm telling you the facts. Those are the facts. The dynamic wave for the design of channel improvement projects should not be touched. The uh, kinematic wave or the, uh, or the gradually varied flow, steady gradually varied flow, is enough. Okay, with that then, we go to the next paper, which is Modeling Loop Ratings in Muskingum Kunch Routing. Modeling Loop Ratings in Muskingum Kunch Routing. So we continue to the Muskingum Kunch Routing. We have written about 10 papers on the Muskingum Kunch over the last 20 years. Recently, we did a, a simplification, one that was going to be published online, because I already told you that, that if you simplify a paper, you can't publish it in a, re, in, a, in a journal, if you simplify it. So if you want people to read it, then you put it online, and 
online will take anything and everything, right? So we did a simplification or a, rather a low, low level paper on the Muskingum Gunch because we believe that the Muskingum Gunch is the way to go. And I think I've already shown you the results of Rosa Aguilar's thesis, where everywhere that we ran the Muskingum Gunch, it was grid independent, while the other competing methods were not. And we have to assume that grid independence is the objective because otherwise, what, what are we doing, right? In 1980, when I met with Fred Thur, who he passed away two, three years ago, he's a very good friend of mine, and uh, he said that, it, that they had worked hard at it for several years and they could not get the grid independence. And I said, Fred, I, I can help you. I have a method that's grid independent. And he was really surprised. How is it that Paz out there in California on his own is coming up with something that they over in Washington had tried for several years and couldn't get? And I said, well, because I've got the right tool, I got the right theory, you know, I, I got the conch uh, report and they kind of didn't know about it. So I helped them get into it. I really helped them get into it through a contract that we had in the early 80s. And we opened up that because once the Army, once the Soil Conservation Service endorsed my work, there was not a whole lot of time after the Army Corps had to do it because they compete. They, they, they kind of get notice of what the other guy is doing. And so the Army Corps then called me up. And then by 1990, they had added the Muskingum Gunch to their models. And it's there. And it's there. Interestingly, though, the Army does not believe fully in the Muskingum Gunch because they kept their, they kept the other methods, the kinematic wave, the fusion wave. No, the, not the fusion wave. The Muskingum Gunch is the fusion wave. They kept the kinematic wave in there and so on and so forth. If I had been them, I would have just dumped the kinematic wave outright, but they didn't do it. And I don't know why they didn't do it. But if you go into, into the models of the Army Corps, they give you a choice. You can use the kinematic wave if you want to. You can use this method. You can use that method. You can also use the Muskingum Gunch, which is kind of a new method, right? But uh, that's it. In my opinion, the Muskingum Gunch supersedes all the other methods of, of channel routing because it's the only one that is grid independent. Okay, so... Even, even the dynamic wave of Fred is not grid independent. Can you believe that? And I'm going to talk about it extensively today as well as later. So let's talk about this. Now, Adolf Lugo is one of our students, a former student of ours. He got a master's degree in the year, I believe, 1997. He came over to me in 1995. He wanted to do a thesis, and I, I uh, signed him up. And usually what happens is that I have a topic that I'm playing with, around with or working with, and I give it to the students so they can wet their feet. So Lugo worked for a couple of years on this problem. I said, the Muskingum Gunch that we have is not a loop rating curve. What if you add the loop rating in there? It can be done. So he did. It was a tough job to do. And it, it had been done for the first time because there was... The dynamic wave of Fred with the loop rating because it was implicit or intrinsic to the problem. And then there was the Muskingum Conch, which did not do the loop rating because the Muskingum Conch was based on a steady, steady uniform flow rating. Because we didn't feel at the time that, uh, that, that there was enough at the beginning, you know, you got to go from simple to difficult. We didn't feel that we should change the slope. The slope was the permanent slope. The slope the, the uniform flow slope, the prevalence slope of the river, uh, to which the, uh, the rating would have to conform. In other words, the, the loop on the rating is around the unique discharge stage relation. It's around, it's not anywhere else. It's around, it kind of encloses or uh, evolves. No, it's not the word evolve. It's, it goes around. It's, it's elongated, but it goes around. And I've, I, I've shown you pictures of that. So, um, so he did it. So we're going to review his, his paper, okay? And I'll, at, the end of this, uh, at the end of this work, I'm going to tell you some interesting and fascinating story about how people get to publish and uh, how scientists like myself and others or academ academicians get to publish. Abstract. The Muskingum Conscious extended to the realm of loop ratings. This is accomplished by reformulating the four-point conventional model, which we already used, 
to use the local water surface slope, right? So all we needed to do was instead of using the st steady slope to use the actual local water surface slope. We had information on the depth that so we could do that and we did it kind of successfully, successfully. The developed model was successful in generating loop ratings under a wide range of kinematic diffusive and steady flow conditions. Numerical experiments were used to test the loop rating masking gum conch. We vary resolution level, meaning uh, the size of the grid, flood wave period, meaning kinematic or diffusive, because the greater the period, the more kinematic the wave is, we know that. We vary base flow for study the nonlinearity. The less of the base flow, the more, the more nonlinear the problem becomes. And the peak inflow base flow ratio also is kind of related to it. And these kinds of things are kind of based on the work that Thomas did in 1934, because we're using his models. Uh, not quite. We use a combination of his models and newer models. Comparison of the loop rating curve with the dynamic wave model. We had a dynamic wave model. It was not Danny Fred's, it was our own ours. We still have it, but we don't use it. Just like I told you, dynamic wave model is, is like a beautiful person out there on the shelf and you look at it every once in a while, but we hardly ever use it, okay? So we have it out there. We haven't used it in a long time, or quite a while, but we decided at the time that we were gonna take our loop rating masking gum conch and compare the results with the dynamic wave that yes, would produce the loop to see where the loops were going. Was it that much different or so? Okay, if the loops were somewhere else apart, they would have shown that either of the methods was wrong. If the loop were, were coalescing, but one of them was wider than the other, it would have shown that one of the methods was not quite correct. It was in the ballpark, but it was not quite correct. And if the loop were one on top of the other, it would show that the, 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 the dynamic wave did not improve on the masking of conch, which is what we intended to show in the first place, by the way, because we knew that that was going to be the case because we were running diffusion models. We were not running dynamic models. We stated that there was going to be diffusion models. Why we were running diffusion models and stay away from the dynamic models? Because the models in practice are diffusion or kinematic. They're not dynamic. Why should we go out there and suffer and solve a dynamic wave that does not exist? Okay, so Muskingum conch flood routing is well established. The model can simulate convection and diffusion. The convection is characterized by the wave celerity and the diffusion is characterized by the hydraulic diffusivity. We know that extensively, repetitiously. The conventional Muskingum conch is based on kinematic wave theory. It uses the equilibrium or, equilibrium or bottom slope which is the Hayami slope. Hayami also used equilibrium with bottom slope, by the way. Uh, yeah, I think so to a large extent. Most of that stuff, including the Duke work, was linear. And since it was linear, it had to be standardized to uh, one slope. You cannot use it because we're using, this model here that we're, I'm talking about is nonlinear. But Duke, all the work, 100% of the work that Duke did was linear. As a matter of fact, he had a linear methodology. His book is called Linear Theory, okay? So, so we're in the same ballpark there. The Muskingum conch routing model. We already know that. This is repetitious, it's been, it's been all over. You know the C's and the D's. I added in here the equation five, which is the, uh, the lateral inflow. Because without this equation five, you cannot do watershed routing. You can only do channel routing. Actually, not quite. If you're going to do channel routing with lateral inflow, you'll still need equation five. But typically, when, we, when people do channel routing, somehow they don't use a whole lot of lateral inflow. So the lateral inflow is preeminent when you do watershed routing because the lateral inflow is coming from the rain. You got to convert the rain into flow. It's lateral, right? So C3, the coefficient C3 is absolutely instrumental or absolutely necessary in watershed routing but not in channel routing. In channel routing, you can either forego or forget about that it exists and so on and so forth. Okay, the Quran number, we already know. The So Reynolds number, we already know. Uh, the So Reynolds number was our creation. I already told you that it was the reciprocal of the Roach So Reynolds number. We didn't think Ro Roach was correct in, in doing that. Uh, Roach had borrowed it from a concept that I believe a Frenchman had developed, the Pecklin number, P-E-C-L-E-T. For, for the app application on water quality. Because it's the same thing, diffusion, 
numeric diffusion and numerical diffusion or dispersion in water quality, same thing. Equations are the same. Similar equations, similar methodologies. So the Peckley number is the Roche number, but ours is the reciprocal of the Roche, num Roche number, Roche uh, cell Reynolds number. Okay. We call it cell Reynolds number because we couldn't find any proper name to call it. And since it was a ratio of diffusivities, then in the cell and the Reynolds number was a ratio of diffusivities or, or yeah, diffusivities, then we just by extension call it cell Reynolds number. We don't, we didn't have a Jones person to call it. Okay. And that happened repeatedly, by the way. I'll talk about this later on. Okay, so um, okay, so we have the constant parameter we already talked about. Uh, recent extension of the Maskingam Kanch enables it to partially account for the fluid dynamics. Yes, uh, this is an important equation, but we still don't know exactly how exactly is it that uh, changes the flow. We know for a fact that if the fruit number gets to be two, but then the number equal one, this whole thing just goes to zero and therefore we're stuck. We have a different process altogether. But in order for you to get Vedernik of equal one, you have to have a steep channel and you have to have concrete or rigid boundary. You cannot get it any other way. And that's why the Bolivians who did, who have steep channels and we have, and who built rigid boundary, they have them all the time. They have all kinds of roll waves. When I was there two years ago, they had 10 roll waves per year in each one of those two channels, 10. And some of them were trying to even get out of the channel. And we're gonna talk about this in two or three weeks in more detail. So we have in here the loop rating Maskingam Crunch. I'm going to have to get done here pretty soon. Loop rating Maskingam Crunch. So this is very thick, by the way. I was reading it today because I read it every day. Every morning I read it just to make sure I bring it up to the front of my, of my head. This is very thick stuff, and I'm not going to ask that you remember everything because you won't be using it, short of actually developing your own model, and you're not really going to do that. But just read it for the heck of it to see how we did it and how we carried out our numerical experiments. We used the, the uh, yes, we equation 10 is the equation of Thomas. Okay, I cite there Thomas 1934. You are familiar with it because it was part of our problem too. We use several resolutions levels. Resolution level one and two, you're familiar with this. We already talked about it in, in other cases. Flood wave period 28, 24, 48, and 96. Those are the standard uh, Thomas flood wave periods. Base flow, I changed from CFS to meters in here. And peak inflow ratio two to five, two and five. So this is standard Thomas stuff only that expressed in metric system. And then we proceeded to assess if there was or there was not a loop. And in fact, there was a loop. So we then dimen uh, measure the loop. It's, it says in there, measure the loop and express it in, the, in a dimensionless form, uh, discharge over discharge and depth over depth, because you're plotting discharge and depth, right? It's a rating curve. So the x-axis is the discharge and the y-axis is the depth. So you can measure the, the loop in two directions, in two horizontal, I mean, yeah, horizontal and vertical directions, and then express it against a normalized discharge. So that will get, you will get a dimensionless, dimensionless number. So we get that in here, in this table, which has 24, I believe it's 24 runs. And you can examine this at your own time, but there's one thing in here that is clear, that the, uh, the, the loop, as you can see here, the dimension is loop was 1.4%, 1.1%, 0.006. So for the longer time period, which was less diffusive, the loop was less. So we follow the behavior. That is exactly the way it happens for the whole thing. Everything is like that. So we uh, were justified in saying, yes, we did it correctly. It was done correctly. Uh, unfortunately, like in any nonlinear method, the mass conservation is perfect but we figured that it was very small. In most cases, it was very small. Take a look at the mass conservation on the right side. We said that we could not come up, we could, because it is a nonlinear method and there's a lot of computations in there, that we could not come up with a, uh, 
in ac perfect accuracy. What happens is that the more computations you do, the less accurate the problem becomes. We already talked about that. I'm going to tell you in two weeks why and how is it that that happens. In other words, more does not necessarily mean better in our field. In our field, we should strive for the middle ground. Not too little, not too more. Not too large, large in the middle. So we generated these loop radians with the Muskingum Gunge, pretty cool, 24 hours, 48 hours, a smaller loop as you can see, and then 96 hours is a very small loop, already getting to be semi-diffusive, almost kinematic. And if you apply the conventional, or rather the applicability criteria which we have developed, you will find that are already in the kinematic, very close to the kinematic range. So we proceeded to compare with the dynamic model. Luckily, we had a dynamic wave model at the time. And um, actually, I built a dynamic wave model prior to building the Muskingum Gunge. Muskingum Gunge was built in the early 80s, while the dynamic wave model was built in the late 70s. So we were able to test the dynamic wave model. And we came up with this situation. There's minor differences, but not too many to be really called upon. As you can see, uh, at this point, I would have to, I believe the triangles, the triangles are the dynamic wave. So the dynamic wave is giving me a little more stage and the Muskingum Gunge a little less stage. But the, the, the difference is very small. I think I would say from a practical standpoint that they're giving me the same answer, which goes on to prove that the wave that we tried was not dynamic. It was Muskingum Gunge, it was diffusive. Okay, now, interesting, Lou, and I'm going to finish in here by saying that the, uh, the Muskingum Kunch doesn't have any gimmicks because you're matching physical and numerical diffusion. You got a numerical diffusion, you got a physical diffusion, you match them and you get the answer, okay? Because the Muskingum Kunch has so much diffusion built into it by, by its numerical nature that it does not need any artificial diffusion. While the dynamic wave as it's set up, has no diffusion of a numerical nature. And you cannot run it because it will blow up on you eventually, like the Richardson scheme. Remember I told you that. So then you have to provide a little bit of artificial diffusion, dissipation, artificial dissipation, in order to make the model workable. And the way to do that is by offsetting the weighting factor. In other words, the derivatives are not fully centered. The time derivative is off-centered from 0 0.5. 0 0.5 would, would be fully centered, but we use 0.55 or 0.6. Everybody does that. Anybody that wants to run the dynamic wave model has to use a theta, which is the off-centering of the derivatives at 0.55 or 0.6. We do not recommend that they abuse it and point, put 0.7 or 0.8 or 0.9 because they will obliterate the results on top. That means the results that are important are, are going to be shaved off. So that's the story. So as you can see, we have a complete method, pure method, which has a gimmick. And an approximate method, like a Muskingum Kanch, which is not really the full-blown equations, and it has no gimmick. And they give the same answer. In other words, if I started to using a theta higher, that dynamic model would change. That the answer that you see in there will change. If I use a theta one, I hadn't done it, but I mean, my guess is that it would reduce. It would come, uh, closely approxim approximating the other curve. But I'm not justified in doing that because I know that that is wrong, okay? So that's basically it. That's basically it. I was gonna tell you a story, a personal story about this, but it's not a very happy ending story, so I'm going to skip it. So uh, now, um, now, the next thing we're going to talk about here, we got 25 minutes, okay. Time of opening. Satyaji Rao and Nazi Manzuri were working with us in the year 1999, 1997-98, I believe it was, 98. Satyaji Rao was with me in 1997. Satyaji Rao was from the National Institute of Hydrology those people out there had a program funded by the United Nations to get to get uh, consultants from the world, hydrology consultants, to go out there and share some time with them, share their knowledge and experience. So I was there a couple times over in the early 90s. Subsequently, I, I found out that since, since I guess 
they liked the work I did or whatever, but they started sending me people for me to work with. So I received them gladly because anytime somebody sends me a person to work with me, I see a paper in the making, right? That's the way it has to be. And at that time, we really wanted to do that. So I had about one, two, three, uh, Satyaji Rao was the last one of five people that they sent over a period of four years, 1994, 96, 95, 96, 97. I am willing to say that even Satyaji Ra was later, but I'm not remembering at this point exactly when he was with us. I know that this paper was published in 1990, 1999, so he had, he had to be there a year or two earlier. Nazi Manzuri was one of our students. You see, she's listed in here as grad student. Nazi, nice lady, very hardworking. I believe what happened was that I started this paper with Satyaji and then at the end uh, he had to leave because he was only with us for four months. Well, Nazi was with us for like more than a year. So Nazi and I did this work. Basically, the way it works is that I have the students do the work and if they can do it, then I'll do it. And I think Nazi was very good and she did her share here. It is a very thick paper. It's a very thick paper. I read it this morning. I read it this morning. Uh, I'm almost afraid that I'm going to find an error in one of my papers and then have to backtrack. And in this case, it was not, it's almost like that. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to derive equation one. I knew that it was correct, but I, I mean, if somebody asked me, how did you do it? Then how did you do it? And I spent some time. I'm not going to reveal how much time. It was a lot of time. And finally, I realized, I, realized, I remember what I had done. It was done in the previous paper. It was already spelled out. So in our paper on the applicability, we derived this equation one. But the only difference is that, that's, that in, in that equation, we just wanted to, to switch from the spatial domain to the temporal domain. So we wanted to be able to speak in terms of the dimensionless wave period, in terms of the dimensionless wavelength, right? So it would be, it came out to be two pi over C star, sigma star. But that didn't do the job for this paper. It did the job for the other paper, just to talk in general terms about non-dimensionalizing and changing, changing from one domain to the other domain. And I think when we discussed that paper, I already told you that uh, after I had published my second, my first paper, my web, my, uh, my SCAR paper, I met with my friend Michael Stevens from Canada, and I gave the paper. I know he's a very smart gentleman. I don't know exactly where he is right now, but I say, Mike, uh, I'd like you to take a look at this paper, and he did. He took a look at it, and he came to me a couple weeks later, and he said, Pons, it's a great paper, but I suggest that you convert it to the temporal domain because the hydrologists don't like to think in terms of spatial domain, and he's correct because the hydrologists don't sense, cannot see the length of the wave but they can sense the time base of the wave because the wave goes up and goes down. When it disappears, it finished, right? So the hydrologists are talking about wave period, wave duration, but not wavelength. There's a conversion out there because the wavelength over the wave period is equal to the celerity. So if you had two of them, you can get the third one. So I can get the period or I can get the wavelength from the celerity. If I have the period and the celerity, I can get the wavelength. And if I have the wavelength and the celerity, I can get the period. If I have the, period, the, length, the length and the period, I can get the celerity. <laughs> That's a fact, okay? That's a fact from physics. So, so that conversion was necessary, and we did it for the second paper on the applicability, and then we pursued it in here. Okay, now, what are we trying to do in here? You remember the S-curve, and I'm going to pull this up in here for better explanation in here. I hope we don't run out of time. Uh, let me see over here. Channel Hydraulics, Chapter 10. No, no, that's not it. Okay, there it is. There we go. There we go. Now we need to share it. Okay, what what, what are you what are you guys seeing in there? The green, the my S curve, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. This is my S curve. So everybody knows that these are the kinematic waves over here, okay? That these are the dynamic waves. 
And in the middle between the kinematic waves and the dynamic waves in this portion in here, where the celerity is not being sensed, but the attenuation is being sensed, then we have the diffusion waves, okay? So kinematic up to here, real kinematic, then diffusion waves from here to here, and then unfortunately it does vary with the fruit number. If the fruit number is low, it takes time to get there. But if the fruit number is high, it, it gets there very quickly. That's just the nature of the beast, okay? Then we get to dynamic wave, which I already told you repeatedly, we claim that they don't exist because they have high attenuation, and then on the other side, we get to these other waves, which of course, originally the Lagrange waves were referred to as dynamic waves. And there is where the misnomer comes into confusion. I know one of you talked to me today saying that, do dynamic waves attenuate or not attenuate? Well, that depends. If you're talking Lagrange, they don't attenuate. But if you're talking Fred, they do, and they're the most attenuating. It is unfortunate that there's a semantic problem in here, but I did not create it, okay? I think the problem was created by Danny Fred, who started calling dynamic waves the, one, the waves in the middle. They should have been called, as I do in my book, mixed kinematic dynamic. So you have in here, kinematic dynamic over here and mixed kinematic dynamic. That's a better way of referring to it because we can't come up with a better name. We don't have another name to refer to the mixed kinematic dynamic waves. Okay, so that's the story. So we're talking about the Lagrange waves. now. We looked at the applicability of the kinematic wave over here, and we wrote a paper on that. And we said that t, uh, t times s over u, d sub naught, whatever, greater than 75 or 85. And then for the diffusion wave, we had this t, r, s sub o over g, I don't remember the, the, the equation, greater than 15 or greater than 30 if you take the whole period. Okay. But like we have in here applicability issues going up, going up on this curve, we also have an applicability issue going down <laughs> over here on the other side, over here. Like in here, there's no attenuation. But if you come over here, it starts attenuating because it, it meets the curve from the other side. It has to attenuate, okay? Then, then we decided that we were gonna do the same thing we did in here at the bottom, but at the top. But in this case, it was issued or it was connected with the, not, uh, not, not this one now, I am, I am now, uh, I have to go back. Yeah, I have to go back now from here. Uh, okay, now we're back where we were, okay? So now we are going to say that the short waves, the short waves are generated when you have a canal and you have a gate and you open or close the gate, you generate a wave, okay? And the understanding is that they should not suddenly close the gate or open the gate because you would have a, a truly Lagrange wave. Let's call them Lagrange waves. The Lagrange wave, uh, which is dynamic, I mean, the Lagrange wave, the one on the right side of the spectrum that does not have any attenuation. And therefore, once created, it will have a tendency to propagate itself ad infinitum. And of course, it doesn't happen that way because there's all sorts of other things that come into the picture. But you don't want a wave to be travel, traveling on the, on the channel. We should try to minimize the, the traveling of waves that are produced by management, by the way. Because the only, way, the only reason that a wave could travel in a channel like that is if you're operating a gate and the gate is suddenly, suddenly shut down or open and so forth. So we want to manage that creation of these surges or waves, right? And we claim quite correctly that we can do this by coming down on that curve. Because if we come down on that curve, there's gonna be diffusion for sure. The mathematics doesn't change or doesn't lie. So then we set out with Nazi and Satyaji Rao to estimate when would the, when would we be coming down on the curve so that we can state the numerical, the wave number and the wave period. And that is the reason why since we know the wave number and we don't know the wave period, we had to come up with the definition of the wave period, which is this, is two pi over C star, C star, sigma star, which you can find in our second paper, Applicability of Kinematic. I urge you to review it or take my word for it. But there's an F square in here, which is unusual, well, not unusual. There's an F square in there that we had to come up with. Why? Because the thing, I don't, I'm not gonna show you the, the page in here, but as you can see, they don't come down at the same time. They are phased out in terms of the fruit number. 
So we had to figure out a way of incorporating the fruit number in there as a parameter. Now, when I did my applicability criterion, I, try, I tested F square and F, and I proved to myself that F was better for that calculation. For the, for the diffusion waves, it was be, F was better. But in this case, we had to try F square. And we are justified because, well, not justified, but we are kind of following what Wilheiser did in, this, in the middle 60s. He defined the kinematic flow number by incorporating a, a, a fruit number square in the denominator. I know I'm not going to show it to you, but, but review the kinematic, the definition of the kinematic flow number in my book, Chapter 4, Section 4.2, and you'll see that he has an F square in the denominator. So we decided to follow what he was saying, and it works fine. The F square has to be there for purposes of, of, for purposes of normalizing. Meaning, normalizing means expressing it in general. Okay. So for a given fruit number, and now here's the trick in here, or the procedure, the algorithm. For a given fruit number, we determine the normalized dimension as wave period that will produce a 0.1 amplitude. That means it will dissipate the wave 90% after one period. That's a lot, right? Uh, this is referred to as threshold normalized dimension as wave period. So we calculated that, and we have a computational algorithm, which is kind of complicated, so I'm not going to stress on it because we spent a lot of time on it. We don't have the time. But the point is that we came up with T star star, which is the normalized dimensionally waste period. No, the, the, um, the uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the we if you follow the algebra, the dimensionless wave period is that, and therefore we can express the normalized dimensionless waste period as equation two. You just follow the algebra. I followed it this morning and it is all correct, okay? Although, if you sit down to do it, it may take you hours, unfortunately. It took me hours, so it takes you to take hours, too. It's not an easy subject, okay? So, dynamics of waves is not an easy subject. So, but it, it, it permeates uh, the, our course. The computational hydraulics is based on that, okay? So, we didn't use fruit number less than one, less than point one, because we didn't think it was necessary. Nobody out there is going to design a channel with less than 0.1 fruit number because it will settle the settle the solids. For fruit number greater than 0.5, we felt that it was an unusual. Most people try to stay away from high fruit numbers unless they really, really have to, like the Bolivians. The Bolivians have slopes of 5 or 6%. You know, that's a torrent. So therefore, they cannot avoid it. Uh, they could avoid it by moving somewhere else, but they're not going to do it. They're going to solve the problem right there. 6% is the channels in Bolivia. They're coming down on that uh, those two rivers. Why so high? Because they're high. That's just the morphology it dictates that it should be 6%. Okay, so the time of opening, we figured out what the time of opening should be, which turned out to be slightly vary with the fruit number. So even though we, we square the fruit number in there, it was still not being independent of the fruit number. It was slightly varying with it. We felt that it was okay. We felt that it was okay. I could have fiddled with it and come up with a, perhaps a fruit number 2.2 or 2.3, and it perhaps would have made it independent of the fruit number. But we decided uh, not to do it. We just carried the fruit number because the fruit number square is very easily reproducible as u square over gd, which is easy. It, you can drop it out of the equation. So we used two, and we were justified or, or content with having a table where the, the T prime star, star star varies slightly with the fruit number. And then we finally did the necessary conversions for the T sub O, which is the uh, time of opening. You can follow this through the algebra in expressed in Manning, in SI units, and in customary units. And that, these are the formulas that the time of opening should vary with a parameter t, t prime star star, which comes from, oh, I'm sorry, which comes from the previous, let me see, previous page. Yeah, the t star star star, here, here, the t, t prime star star for a given fruit number, which we know, it's going to give that. So then we move on to the last page, and we apply that times the hydraulic radius to the four thirds. The four thirds is there because of Manning. If it were Chessy, it would be only four three thirds. 
over n squared, the chassis would be in there. We, the f would have popped up, r f. But never mind, people are going to use the f. And then that's it. Those are the answers. So then I decided with Nazi, Nazmi, no, not Nazi, Nazmi, what is her name? Nazi, Nazi, with Nazi. I believe she is, I could be wrong on this, but I believe she's originally from Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and um, so we vis visited the Imperial Valley to gather some data because I had some friends out there because I worked with them many years. Uh, actually, have, we have students over at um, Imperial Irrigation District, my students in the 90s. There was one gentleman out there who is head of the hydraulics or something like that. So we touched base with them and they gave us the data very nicely. And we apply the formulas that, um, that we had developed. And you can follow this through completely, by the way, but it will take you some time. And of course, for, in, in, for the calculation of the diffusion, we need to use our original equations, which are given in here in appendix one. Equations for wave celerity and log decrement. You guys are already familiar with these equations. A, C, B, remember? Yeah, so the delta, the logarithmic decrement. So we do these calculations and um, we have all the hydraulic, they gave us two data, two canal shapes, small, medium, small and medium. The bottom width was 161 meters for the first one and 1.22 meters for the medium one. The discharge, the design flow, design flow depth, design discharge, one of them is 1.42, cubic meters per second, and the other one is 2.29 cubic meters per second is a larger channel. These channels are indicative of the typical channels in the Imperial Valley. Imperial Valley has a lot of channels. They distribute the water all over the place. They have 200,000 acres, I believe. I'm pretty sure of that, 200,000 acres. And plus, they, over the Coachella Valley, they've got 60 or 80,000 more. They're suffering now because they don't have as much water as they used to. We took 5% of it. About 20 years ago, we basically sued Imperial, Con Imperial Valley and got 5% of their water. Successfully got 5% of their water. But we now have it. We're drinking it, and they don't have it. And they're kind of in a... One wonders what's going to happen to them. I don't know. I think they're going to linger for a while, maybe 100 years. But at the end, they're going to die. Because that's just the way it is. Anything goes up and it goes down. Okay? Don't quote me on that. Uh, there's all kinds of things happening in there. One of them is the uh, encroachment of the wind farms. We have to have the wind farms, right? Everybody says that. So where are we going to put them? Well, out there is one choice. There's a lot of wind farms already there. I've seen many of them. And they continue to increase. Another thing that's happening out there is the... Uh, the discovery of, of, of the metal lithium as industry. Apparently, the metal lithium is a new gold because it is in every cell phone that we use, and there's millions and millions, billions of cell phones. So, so any country that has a lithium deposit could exploit it and make money off it. And I believe uh, Imperial Valley or Imperial, the Southern Sea, the people out there are getting ready to do that. I just read that in the paper a couple of days ago. Okay. Um, the largest lithium deposits nowadays are in uh, southern Bolivia. There's a lake out there full of salt and full of lithium. And they, of course, intend on developing that. They're, they're doing it right now to sell the lithium to the world for the production of the rechargeable batteries of lithium. So that's that. basically the story. I exceeded my time by one minute. So, uh, again, I repeat your presentation in a week from now. If you have any question whatsoever, just let me know about the content, the procedure, etc. Just get a hold of me. I do have a meeting today at 7 with Cassidy, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. Cool. That's it. So we'll see you. Uh, I am posting all these classes, particularly of computational hydraulics, uh, 20 hours later. So by 1 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow, it will be posted. So if you want to review it or see it or whatever, now or later, you can do it. Just have to find it. Or if you can't find it, then let me know. It's in my 400 series, the teaching part of it, at the end of it, at the bottom, because of the new ones. Okay? Thank you very much. See you later.
Bye-bye. Thank you.